Good morning, Acts chapter 15 and part number 16. So if your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter number 15, part number 16. So again, we've been looking at James and his reply to the people. James, of course, is a leader there uh, in the grouping at Jerusalem. And as being a leader, they are looking to him as an authoritative figure to either confirm or deny what Peter has said and what Paul has stated in relation to the Gentiles and their conversion. So because the Gentiles have now uh, been, been believing, they've received the Holy Spirit with you know, Cornelius and, of course, Paul's ministry a great deal, there is this hesitation to allow the Gentiles to be a part or, or, or be with them or associate with them. And so the Jews have come on and said, you know what, you guys need to be circumcised, you got to keep the law of Moses. And it was troubling their souls. They were getting a little bit concerned about that. And so obviously, uh, it, it, the as you, as you read the beginning of the text, Acts chapter number 15, you see that it says that the, the Jews decided that they should go to the elders and the apostles about this question, right? But, but, the, but the truth is, you know, of course, Paul's like, oh, I'm not going to do anything unless it's, it's, it's necessary. And he goes by revelation in, in, in Galatians chapter number 2. Remember, he says that he went by revelation up uh, 14 years after to go see them and to communicate unto them that gospel that he preached. So there was a need for clarity in the gospel message. There was a need for clarity in relation to the law. And Paul does it in a specific way. Remember, he doesn't just come in in Acts chapter number 15 and say, uh, you know what? Whosoever are justified by law, you're fallen from grace. You know He doesn't come in and do that. He doesn't say, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in the sight. In reality, he doesn't say a whole lot. right? He doesn't really get involved. And we know because he came into them privately that were of reputation, lest by any means he had run in vain. So he didn't want to come in there and just start swinging punches. Number one, he's outnumbered. Okay, So what would have happened probably there was probably what would happen in Acts chapter 21. They would have tried to kill him. Right? So we see that that progression slowly happens. These are the same people in Acts chapter 15 here that are in Acts chapter 21. Okay? Keep that in mind. So in Acts chapter 21, Paul finally comes down. He tells him, hey, look at the Gentiles. They go, great, but you see how many Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the law. And, of course, Paul does uh, his little you know, law dance and shaves his head and puts a bow on. And, and even after all of that, you know, what do they try to do? Try to kill him. They uh, bring him up to the leadership, and they bind him. And, of course, he sits there and speaks in the Hebrew tongue, tries to get their attention, and says, well, look, don't you understand that I'm just like you guys? Why are you trying to kill me? What is the issue here? The issue here is their flesh, right? So what it is is, is it's, it's their holding on as much as they can to the fleshly aspect of who they are and not understanding who the spiritual aspect of who they are is. So in Acts chapter number 15, of course, the, the, the big, the big you know, point of contention is salvation, salvation by uh, grace through faith and not by the deeds of the law, being justified by faith, without the law as the fathers have been as everybody has been and so the, the gentile ministry of course is completely 100 percent prophetic is it not yes gentile salvation the conversion the preaching to the gentiles is prophetic it is something that we see constantly over and over and over and over again we see that in his name shall the gentiles trust who is that well that's that's jesus christ and we know that that gentile salvation is not the mystery so use that to your advantage because I've heard it preached many times that Gentile salvation is a mystery, and then all of a sudden you're really confused because you go, but, but there's Gentiles and they're being saved, right? Now, the method and manner of the Gentile salvation is a mystery in the sense that raising up the Apostle Paul, well, yeah, that seems ridiculous, right? Why, why, would, we, why would he, a man who's so deserving of the, of the wrath of God, be lifted up and raised up? Well, to demonstrate the grace of God. If we're going to go ahead and demonstrate the ministry of reconciliation through the grace of God, let's go ahead and start off with a bang and just offer some amazing grace, right? Wow. It's pretty, pretty impressive. And so then anybody that's going to doubt it in the sense that can somebody really, can I really be saved? Is it possible for me, such a putrid, wretched, you know, well, look at, look at me, right? The, 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 I'm, I'm the least of these saints, is this grace given, right? Does Paul say that? So you kind of get an idea of where we're at in Acts chapter 15. Now the, now the validation point is, is not to go back and say, let's prove all of prophecy. All of prophecy is proved in our relation to the Gentiles. That's not the point, okay? Because that's not going to work. We're going to look at some passages and you're going to go, what? 
So uh, when you read Acts chapter 15, in verse number, read verse number uh, 13 down, he says, And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, okay? And to this agree the words of the prophets. That's what we're trying to stress to you guys, is he's not trying to prove everything that the prophets have spoken. You follow me? It's not the other way around. It's not, I'm going to read these prophecies and then say, and these, this right here is all the proof of it. No, what he's saying is that this, in terms of the Gentiles and God visiting them to take them out of people for his name, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. I mean, they're starting to get a little bit bigger picture of that. Of course, there's not a there's not 100% clarity, right? There's no, there's no like, James isn't going to go, well, this is the dispensation of the grace of God, and let's all turn to Romans chapter number 11 and look at our fall, and, and, and now through, through, uh, you know, through jealousy, we're going to be provoked. And that's not what he's thinking at all. He's still continuing on the program. We're Israel, man. We're up here. We have not fallen. We're up here. And as time progresses, what's he going to see? He's going to see the fullness of the Gentiles start to just overwhelm the Jews, right? And when you get into a synagogue, what are you going to see? You're not going to see a whole lot of Jews anymore. You're going to find these synagogues, really, it's going to finally be just really a, a, a grouping or a congregation, like the church at Corinth, which of course is mixed, but it's a predominantly what? It's a predominantly Gentile grouping. And so we're going to see why they, in Acts chapter 15, it's a necessity for them to go in and say, hey, uh, there's some things you guys shouldn't be doing, like dancing around naked and have fornication parties while you guys offer idols, offer meat to idols, and then eat all the strangled blood, right? That's kind of the things. It goes to the things that, eh, eh, no, we're not doing that. That's what you, you know, Gentiles do. That's not what we're going to do to keep the peace in the congregation uh, of God. So in Acts chapter 15, we must see that he's saying, and to this agree the words of the prophets, and to this agree. Make sense? To this. This part is what he's trying to prove. He's not trying to prove everything that the prophets have spoken. That's the, that's the reverse way of thinking. You're trying to just prove that the Gentiles are a part of God's program. Make sense? That's what he's trying to say. That Gentile salvation is there. It's in the Old Testament. So if you're going to argue and you're going to disagree, you, you're not going to disagree with Peter anymore. You're not going to disagree with James. You're going to disagree with the prophets. You're going to disagree with who? Ultimately, God. So if you want to do that, then, then so be it. Go for it. Right? But known unto God are all his works since the beginning of the world as he says right here. So going on in Acts chapter 15, he says this and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Now he quotes several passages of scripture. We've been studying some of them in the book of Amos we're going to look at some of the stuff in 2 Samuel we're going to look at some of the stuff in Isaiah today as well and he says this and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, say the Lord who doeth all these things. Now, he couldn't just say verse number 17. He'd have to use verse 16 to use verse 17. Make sense? So you can't, he can't just say, and, and, and to this degree the words of the prophets, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles of whom my name is called, say the Lord who doeth all these things. Be like, what do you mean? That the residue, what, how does the residue come? What is that? What's that about? Well, you have to use verse number 16. After this, I'll return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So after this is, is the question that we were talking about. What is the this, right? So now you're like, okay, well, there's an after this part. Well, what is this? Well, if you look at the prophetic scripture and you study the book of Amos, what you're going to see is what? What is the whole book of Amos about? Well, we'll turn with me there to the book of Amos. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Joel, Amos, Obadiah are all good books. They all pretty much go hand in hand. Same stuff. What's it about? Day of the Lord. What's it about? The chastisement of the world, the punishment for the world, the wrath of God being poured out against them for what? for their disobedience, for their sin, for their unbelief, etc., etc. So when you look over at Amos chapter number uh, 5, go over, we, we, we went through this a little bit last week, but we're going to go through it again. Go to Amos chapter number 5 and uh, go to verse number 10. He says, uh, they, they hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. 
For as much, therefore, as your treading is upon the poor, and ye take from the him the burdens of wheat, ye have built house of hewn stone, but ye shall not dwell in them. Ye have planted pleasant vineyards, but ye shall not drink wine of them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take a bribe, and they turn aside the poor and the gate from their right. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that ye may live. And so the Lord... The God of hosts shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, and they shall call the husband to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing, and in all the vineyards shall be wailing, for I'll pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord, to what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did free from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me meat, Offer meat, 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 burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials, but let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Now, can we see a little bit about why the tabernacle needs to be restored? Well, yeah, obviously, why? Well, because the tabernacle has been used not to do uh, sacrifice and oblation to God. It's been used for what? It's been used to worship their God. It's been used for idolatry, for, for false worship, for, for sacrilegious heretical purposes. So there's a need for that to be raised up again. During the days of David and Solomon, we know that there was a transition between the tabernacle and, and, the, and the actual uh, temple, right? And, and we see, we talked about kind of that dedicational period, but we see that that tabernacle was, was, the, was the cloth type, right? It's the one that moved around, the tabernacle that was in the wilderness, the same type of things as you see here. Have you offered me unto the sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years of house of Israel? But when you did all of that, you weren't doing it to me. Who were you doing it to? Who were you worshiping? You were doing it all for who? For yourselves, really. For, your, for the God that you raised up, as he says here. Your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. And so we see that this is how Israel typically is. They turn away very quickly. They turn aside very quickly, right? It's like how Christ says, you know, as a, chick that's gather, as a hen does gather chicks under her wings, right? You, you would not. Oh, Israel, oh, Israel, how oft would I, would I gather you, right? One set to occur, but, but it's, there's, the problem is the disobedience, the unbelief, etc. Et that, that didn't change, right? So when, when Jesus says, oh, Israel, Israel, right? It, 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 it's not any different in Acts chapter 15. It's the same thing. Oh, Israel, oh, Israel. You know what I, I liken it to? I liken it to that end part there. Of, uh, of, of Romans chapter number 10. I like how he says it there best. He says, But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth. All day long. All day long I have stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. You know? Some disobedient and gainsaying people are going to start to continue to arise there. You have a little grouping. You have that, you know, we, we call it the little flock, right? And, and, and if you want to use a term, that's fine, right? It's, it's a decent term to use, right? Because it's a little flock. It's not the whole fold, right? The whole fold would be if we gathered all the sheep together, all the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and we got them to all come around, but well, we didn't do that, right? Meaning Christ didn't do that. He, he, was, he was not successful in that ministry. Not because that he couldn't have forced it, but because uh, ultimately the, the will and mind of God was, like as, as James says, no one God are all of his works from the beginning of the world. I'm glad that Israel wasn't all gathered together because they probably would have done a very good job at evangelizing the nations, and I probably would have never heard the gospel, right? So you see in, 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 uh, in, 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 the, in the sense of this little flock or this little grouping of people, you're going to see it, it's, it's, like a, it's, it's becoming smaller and smaller and small. It's not growing. It's not getting bigger. It's not like we're calling the... It's, it's not like there's an association 
between the the Gentile believers that are with Paul and the Jews at Jerusalem. There's th- no, they're like they're anti. They're 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 opposites. They want nothing to do with each other. Paul says, I I didn't let him preach no not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you, right? Do you think that, that, that Paul would say, hey, guys, you guys all need to go to Jerusalem? No, I mean, no, they shouldn't go to Jerusalem. I mean, we know what happens to Jerusalem. I mean, there's, there's, there's prophetic elements of the destruction of Jerusalem that did occur. It's interesting, we don't have any specific verses that talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. Like, as in, like, it records and says, here's when, you know, AD 70 and all that stuff. Here's the, here's the destruction of Jerusalem. I wish we had some of those, but that's just... Maybe I need to study more. Maybe I'll find something. But, you know, in that, I want you to see that there is, there is this, without it being fully revealed, that is, without understanding everything of Romans 9, 10, 11, you're still seeing that stuff take place, right? That's like the, after, Romans 9, 10, 11 is explaining this, what's taking place. You're seeing this fall, the little flock, smaller, 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 smaller. I mean, I look at James and I go, what an apostate person. And you go, how could you possibly say that? I say it because in Acts chapter 21, why is not a single person stand with Paul? Why, did, why doesn't James come up and go, hey, guys, 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 guys. Remember when Barnabas brought in Paul? Remember that? Yeah. I know it took a little bit not to believe him. We were all a little skeptical. And we were still skeptical. But this guy, really, he's, he's, he's hazarded his life. Remember, doesn't he say that? James says that in Acts chapter 15. These men have hazarded their lives. So think about it. Why? But not only that, not only is it just James, it's all of the elders that are with him. If, if, if the church's headquarters is in Jerusalem, okay, right? If we're going to just say that, which is what modern day you know, people would say, that the, that the church's headquarters is in Jerusalem, let me ask you this. Wouldn't we at least have one or two people that would side with Paul, the guy who wrote 13 epistles of the Bible? Maybe, maybe one, maybe two, maybe a handful of them. You at least get a few people to go, wait, 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 guys, stop, 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 stop. This is Paul, man. He saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. He's the one. No, what do they say? Off with his head. Kill him. They want nothing to do with this guy. Why? Well, they, they kept seeing Paul as a threat to them. Yes. And that threat was to what? Well, when you get to partake in the things of God, all of a sudden you're like, wait, hold on a second. Then we're supposed to give that to them. Yeah, but you're not doing it. So now look at what's happening. God circumvented you by way of the mystery. Ooh, they didn't like that, right? You know, people say, see, uh, that just proves to you that uh, all Israel is not all of Israel, and that, you know, they love to talk about that thing. And so, oh, the true elect are those that are of, of uh, Jacob, and uh, yeah, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And I'm like, okay, you just quote, like, are you, are you just mimicking everything Spurgeon said? I mean, do you know anything other than just the few verses? I like to take people to the end of Romans chapter number 11. He says, as touching the what? As touching the gospel, they are enemies, right? Right? But as concerning the election, they are enemies. No. Concerning the election, they are beloved of God. Beloved of the Father. Wow. So all of a sudden you're looking at that going, what, what, does, he, what does he mean by that? Well, it's the same thing as Paul goes in Romans chapter number two, hammers it really hard, and says, He is not a Jew, which is one, you know, outwardly is Jewish, one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart, blah, 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 all that stuff, right? And then people would go, Well, I guess it doesn't mean anything. I guess Jews are just a bunch of idiots. It doesn't really matter. No, in Romans chapter three, then he says, What advantage then hath the Jew? That's the question that's going to, that's the next question on your mind. Then who cares about the Jews? We'll just keep going. We'll just move on with this new thing. Well, much every way, right? And notice how he says it. He doesn't just say a little tiny bit. Or, or just, just, a, just, just a little hair of, of, uh, of, of, of you know, benefit to being a, uh, being a fleshly Jew. No, he says, much every way. And he says, now, he's not going to get into all of it. We could get into all of it. As, uh, Romans chapter 9 tells you what all the things are. But uh, chiefly, because unto them were committed the oracles of God, right? And those oracles of God are kind of the, every time I use the word oracle, does anybody know what they think of? I mean, if you're an 80s kid, you know what you think of. You think of what? The never-ending story, right? The oracles. <laughs> Does anybody remember this? Yeah. Am I the only? Okay, there's a couple, there's a couple you know, 30-year-olds here that remember, remember the things. And the two oracles that are up there, and they got to make the way through. And um, um, not Sebastian. What's the kid? Is it Sebastian? Uh, Sebastian's the kid. Wild. And then what's the other kid's name? 
Yeah, Trey, you, Trey, you, right, 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 right. So like that whole deal and going through it, and it's just really funny because you know you, you this these oracles are these this like uh, you know protector, but then also it's the, uh, the the fundamental aspect or element of it. It's the sacred truth, you know. It's what is there. So every time I read the word oracles, I can't help but think of that, you know. But if you read, if you read, um, you know that that part of Romans chapter nine just for a minute, he says it really clear. He says it like this. this. These are all the things that the, uh, the Israelites have. In verse number 4 of Romans chapter 9, he says, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of law and the service of God and the promises? Well, wow. that's what they have. Right? They have all of those things, plus they have the oracles of God. Okay? Now, if you want to break down all of that, that's a lot of stuff. Okay? So that would take us hours and hours to go through, but just to give you an idea. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a, a diminution in Israel. Note that. We're not seeing a, a raising up of Israel, as in we're saying, all Gentiles are now Israelites. That's, you, don't, you don't see that, okay? In Acts 15, he doesn't say, oh, they're all Israelites. Oh, you guys aren't Israel because we're all Israel. He, you follow what I'm saying? He doesn't do that. He doesn't make it like well, there's a replacement that's happening here with these guys. What he's saying is, no, those guys are all fallen, right? And inside of Israel, you're, there is the believing remnant, and there's the unbelieving apostate Israel, Okay? Pretty, pretty, pretty clear. So what I wanted to show you is that in, in the book of Amos, you're going to get these guys who are the majority, just like, but you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, giant, you're, you, these are your star gods that you made unto yourselves. These guys are, are the apostates. They're the ones that are doing the fleshly, you know, typical uh, worship of the law, of the things that are going to benefit them. But they're not doing what? They're not, they're not, they don't need faith. They don't believe who Jesus Christ is. They don't understand the reconciliation ministry. And so there is a need, as we'll see, for the tabernacle to be raised up. Because, as we'll see, you know, if you go, if you go to the book of Isaiah, I'm not going to spend too much time on this stuff, but go to the book of Isaiah, and in verse number 2, or chapter number 2, okay? Isaiah chapter number 2 and verse number uh, 1 says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amoz saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, remember, what, what do we talk about the tabernacle being? The place where God dwells, right? Right? Can we talk about that? And the same thing goes with the temple, right? It's the place where God dwells, but you know, Solomon says we understand you don't really dwell there, okay? So it says, Come to the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, where is the great kingdom and city of the Lord? It's Jerusalem, set on a hill, right? A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, right? Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? Right? You following me? I'm just, kinda, I'm just like saying random things, and I'm hoping like you're just doing this. Ding, ding, ding. You're connecting the dots, and a little picture is being formed in your head. That's what I hope. So when he says, And the mountain of the Lord's house should be established in the top of the mountains. Well, why? Well, it's above everything else. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Right? Look what he says. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. We know the reason why they beat their swords into plowshares. Because, look, here's the deal. When you got the almighty, righteous Jesus Christ reigning on the earth, um... You're not going to fight against him. It's not going to work. You're not going to try to rise up kingdom against kingdom because you're all going to put your swords down and beat him into plowshares because you go, well, well, might as well just go ahead and get some food and get some grain, plow the land, till the land, because these swords don't do us any good. Why? Because how are you going to raise a sword against Jesus Christ? You can't. You follow me? I'm saying you, there's just no way. When he takes the kingdoms of this world and he makes them the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there's no need for these guys to try to rule and reign. There's only one that rules and reigns. So as you go through here, he says... They beat their spears into pruning hooks. And look at this. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. And he says, O oh, house of Jacob, come ye and let us, what? Look at this. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Walking in the light is, uh, uh, is, is another way of saying be understanding, right? 
understand what's going on. Walk in the light. Like the little light bulb goes off, you shine the flashlight in the closet, shine the flashlight in the attic, you see everything, right? Without it, you stumble and you fall. And so Jesus Christ, of course, being the light of the world, and we can get into that at a, at a later point in time. But again, go through and you can see this, this aspect here of, of Israel and what they're supposed to do never was fulfilled, okay? We don't see people that, oh, Jerusalem! Does, does a law flow from Jerusalem right now? No, it surely does not, right? Do all nations come to Jerusalem and go, yes, let's get, the, let's get the law of the Lord. Let's get his perfect law. And day and night when we meditate therein and we'll learn it. No. No, you'll get more of the Talmud than you get anything. You get the, the oral traditions that they're going to give down. But you're not going to get the law. You're not going to get teaching and justice and righteousness and mercy. You know, these guys don't even know if they're Jews or not. I mean, as, as Christ says repeatedly, he says that they, they say they are Jews but are not. And they lie. And he says, you know, they are the synagogue of who? Synagogue of Satan. Well, how's that any different than the synagogue or the tabernacle of Moloch and Chion, right? It's no different. It's no different. It's the same thing. Follow me? Well, it didn't like something magically change, and they started, they started to raise up their tabernacles and go that way. So, you know, clearly in, in the book of Amos, go back there for a second. In, uh, go over to, go to Amos chapter number 9, and then, uh, Read verse number, we'll just start with like 8, chapter eight, nine, chapter 9, verse 8. He says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord, God, are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. And so we talked about how the tribulation period of time is a refining process, Right? Right, it's a refining process. He shall baptize you with fire. And so that baptism with fire is this refining process, just like his, the, 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 um, he says in Matthew chapter number 3, we read a couple of those passages, but he, he says that the, the, the fan whose fan is in his hand, who will really truly purge the floor, right? He burns out all the chafe. He gets rid of all the nonsense, burns up all the, all the waste, and then what is he left with? It's the same thing when you have the, 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 the refining process of gold or silver or precious stones, all of those things. It's like we talk about with the judgment seat of Christ. Christ graciously burns up all the fleshly aspects that are a waste, right? And what's left is the gold, silver, and precious stone, not the wood, hay, and the stubble, right? So when you see here that he says, For loyal command, I will sift the house of Israel among all the nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Well, we understand that, that during the tribulation period of time, what does he say? Flee, get out, leave, run away, go, be gone. And why is that? Well, what does the Antichrist do during that tribulation period of time? Well, he sits in, 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 in the temple. And what does he say? What does, what does he call himself? He says he's God, right? Look at me. I'm God. I'm Jesus Christ. Look at me. Well, who do you think is going to be the most deserving of the wrath of God during that period of time? Well, when Christ comes back, you better get the heck out of Jerusalem because, wow, it's not going to be good, you know? You see how that happens? See, but then you have what, what, I think, what I think escapes a lot of people is they forget that there is this tribulation period of time, and then they forget that there's going to be a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Like, they, 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 like, they keep forgetting that that's actually going to occur. Like, it's actually going to happen. It's going to happen. I mean, I, I truly 100% believe that without a, without a doubt in my mind. And you're like, wow, are you that, are you that convinced? I am. I'm actually like 100% convinced that it's going to happen. And the more you study it, the more you go, well, yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. It's going to be pretty interesting. I'm, 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 I'm eager to see that from a heavenly viewpoint, but it's not going to be good for those people who, who are on the earth. So in verse number uh, 10, he says, All sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say that evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day, notice this, what he says, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. And we know why the tabernacle of David has fallen. Remember, we go back to those verses in 5, 25 and 26. Because remember, really, the, the reign of David, was it a good one? Yeah, for the most part. There are some issues. The reign of Solomon, was it the best one? Yeah, it was considered the best reign. You know, After that... Not so, not so much, right? The rest of the kings and the rest of the leadership of Israel, yeah. you know, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad, you know? Uh, and, and it just progressively gets that way. And, and so as you, as you see that and you unpack it, you see here, in that day while I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, you're understanding why it's fallen, right? Why is it really fallen? What's, what does it come back to? 
the deceiver. Comes back to the deceiver who does his typical things that he always does, which are the deceptive practices of, you know, from the very beginning, the same stuff he's always done. He just deceives. It's all he does. He tells lies, and then he makes you believe lies. I really don't think he, people, I, I mean, if you, if you put a lot of uh, trust in Christianity today, I'm sorry for you. Um, because they're, they're really almost, it's almost a hopeless and fruitless endeavor. Um, I've talked to so many people in the last couple of weeks, and it's just like, it's downright depressing. It really is. It's actually depressing to talk to people because you, you sit there, you try to try to discuss things with them, and you're like, dude, you don't. And, and you know they'll they'll say things like, oh, oh, he that knoweth, he that saith he knoweth something is proud, and well, he that knoweth nothing. It's like, what are you talking about? He that knoweth nothing. You know, if you think you know something, you know nothing. And it's like that's not what the verse means. You know, and it's like they 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 just have these these five, six, eight verses that they use, and it drives me bananas. Don't ever go on any of like the Pathios forums or, or our Christianity or any of these major forums. You will drive yourself mad. It's like shouting into a wall. It doesn't matter. You can just shout. You're just, it's going to bounce right back in your face. They don't listen. They don't care. They don't want to be truthful with it. They're so concerned with the dogmatic aspects of what they're doing in, in their religious system that you, you can't, it's, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to convert them. You know, I, I like how Paul says it in Second Timothy chapter number two. He says that God would grant them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. You know, what has to really take place is the Holy Spirit has to grip them to the point and say, "Hey, wake up! What the heck are you doing?" Right? And so I reached that point, and I, many people do reach that point. The, it's not like there's a point of no return, but for most people, they just continue on in it because it's just what they've always done. And and I really, what I try to get to people is I try to. Uh, there, was, there was a thing, I remember talking to you guys about this a while back, it was called the uh, Let's Be Honest, remember that campaign? I thought it was great, I'm like, let's be honest, this sounds amazing, let's be honest, I'll be honest, how about you? And it was all about being honest with the scripture, right? And I was like, this sounds good, I like it, I like the campaign, I like the thought, now granted it's a little bit of a marketing ploy, which is, you know, like, like most of church today. Um, and so, the I'll be honest thing, I said, okay, that sounds good, but when I got to it, it was let's be honest, but I'm going to be deceitful, <laughs> right? So it's like, well, that's not what we're looking for, right? So the guys were all trying to be honest, and the guy who was giving the messages are going to be deceitful. So, you know, I don't have a corner on the truth. I don't have a uh, handle on it over anybody else. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have every answer to every question under the sun, but um, I will tell you that I've, I've read uh, the scripture. I, I've read Romans to Philemon a gajillion times. I've read Matthew through Revelation a lot. Um, I remember one time I was sitting in church, and this was probably six months ago, and I was looking for a verse, and as I was looking for a verse, I was like, man, is there, is there anything? Do I have a page that doesn't have writing or highlighting? And there was two pages in the entire Matthew through Revelation that didn't have highlighting or writing in it. The entire thing. And I said, huh, never done that before. Now, that's not a boasting or a proud thing, but that's something that says, wow, I I, I don't realize I've gone through so much sometimes and how many verses I've written on, but I had two pages in there, and I wanted to be like, oh, I just want to write something on those two pages so I can say I have, I have something written on every one. I don't remember the two pages that they were. It was something that was like, a, it was like the end of a chapter or something on both sides, and there wasn't much there, but maybe, maybe by this, this time I've already written it. But it, it is, I, I, I think oftentimes about Acts chapter 15 and then Acts chapter 21, and then I think later on in Paul's ministry, was like, dude, everybody forsook me, you know? It's like nobody left. Nobody's hanging out here. Am I the only one that wants to care about this? Am I the only one that's going to even spend a little bit of time? And if people were honest, right, and they said, I'll be honest, how about you? All right, truth comes out. Have you ever read Matthew through Revelation? Just asking. Have you read a single book? One of my friends has never, one of my, one of my really good friends says he's never even read the book of Romans. A good friend that went to Keswick for 13 years said he's never read the book of Romans. I that. And I went, wow, what a sad state of affairs, you know? Are you lost? <laughs> you know, because that's kind of a little bit scary if you've never sat there and read it. Now, I'm not, you know, here's the deal, okay? I'm not, I'm not telling you I read my Bible 18 hours a day, okay? There's several days will go by where I don't necessarily read. Now, I'll be reading other things or books or other stuff, and I may be thinking about it. And you shouldn't get into the idea of like, well, i got to sit down, i got to read my Bible for my morning devotions, my afternoon devotions, my before bed devotions, my before I think I'm going to die, before I go to sleep devotions, you know, my Lord's Prayer before I go to sleep. Don't, don't do that kind of stuff. For me, it's more of I'd rather spend five minutes reading something that's actually somewhat profitable, get that in my head, think about it, and then spend the rest of my day thinking about that particular piece of of scripture than trying to go through and well, let me just plow through all the book of Acts. You know, that's not going to really do that much good. Or you're just trying to read it to read it. Don't do that. Read, read, just spend some time. Read Romans 1, 
get it done and then just read it once or twice and then go through the rest of your day and think about it. And then you'll be thinking, oh, what's that verse? What's that really mean? How's that thing work out with that? I don't know. Read it again, then read Romans 2 the next day and go through it. And eventually you'll, you'll get questions, you'll get stuff, and then hopefully you'll get you know, answers. Obviously the Holy Spirit does do a pretty good job of teaching you, but you got to read. And if you don't do it, then you're not going to really learn much. So again, I'm not trying to say, oh, I read every day. And I, I read four hours every day. That's, I don't. I, I'm telling you, I don't. I only read 40 minutes, 30 minutes. Not even that. A lot of times there can be, there can honestly be five, six days where I get so busy with work that I'm like, well, I haven't even opened my Bible this week. That's not good, right? Not a good thing. Now, I will say, of course, I'm looking at other stuff. I have a lot of forums that I read on. I have books and everything else, but I haven't actually gone back to the text, right? And that's when you get a little bit of deviation from that. You do have a problem. Now, with, with Acts, I feel like I'm, I'm on this, like, this path of never finishing it for the millionth year, and, and there's just so many things to go over, but I, I hope you understand that I'm, the, goal, the goal here in this is to have you walk away and go, oh, yeah, got it. Know exactly what's going on there, right? Not like, oh, what did he talk about? There's something weird there. I don't really remember. I want to be pretty clear. Like, I, we, we pretty much hammered it out. We said what it was. And then you can go back and write in the, the parallel scriptures and go from there. But in, in Amos chapter number 9 and verse number 11, you know, I feel like a lot of times I'm dealing with all the same people. I'm dealing with the people who have, who have these tabernacles that they made and they worship their star gods. That's what I feel like. I feel like it's, Jamie goes the other day, we're driving down Salmon Boulevard. She goes, so the Methodist, or the Presbyterian Church meets inside of the Methodist Church. Isn't that weird? I'm like, yeah, strange, huh? That would never happen a long time ago, but now we'll allow it, you know? Well, now the Methodist and Presbyterians have all the more, you know, things that they're in agreement together on, you know? It's per, they're just becoming more and more and more liberal, right? I, lo I love this phrase that somebody keeps telling me. They say, just because somebody sins differently than you, don't judge them. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what does that even mean? Uh, I don't even, don't, even want, don't even want to go down that path. But anyways, you know, the, the, you see, you see this, this coming out, and as I've discussed, the, the three things that I really think that Satan has done a really good job at deceiving people on is number one is prayer. He's turned prayer to a thing where you bow your head and close your eyes as opposed to something you do without ceasing, right? So I try very hard not to do the whole prayer thing. Let's bow our head and close our eyes and, and do this very, like, religious ceremony thing because then you think well that's the only time i can talk to god is if i bow my head and close my eyes so if i'm driving can't pray because i'm i have to bow my head and close my eyes and i discussed that there are there are there are good things for children sometimes where you bow your head and close your eyes because it will detract them from their sensory elements of the hands and the eyes and that stuff and then i discussed why satan has changed that definition of church and he's made it into a, a grouping in a place for evangelism wrong right he's turned the place into the building where you invite people to come to get saved wrong right you know he's changed us into this multimedia extravaganza ceremony where you spend you know millions and millions and millions of dollars on advertising budgets to try to get people in the door right that's crazy to me you know i mean the, uh, bridgepoint was just again in the news this past week you know they're having booming numbers they're hoping in the next 10 years to open 10 satellite campuses throughout pinellas hills from pasco county oh they'll do it all day hands down there's no doubt 100 percent. they will have 10 they may have 20 right whoop de doo right? <laughs> you, you see it, though. If you see, if you see how they work, though, they got the pretty colors, they got the pretty lights, they have the, the awesome logos and all the stuff. It's like, it's just like you're going to McDonald's and you're looking at the menu. You got it, you got, what do they try to do? It's called expectation versus reality, right? They show you this picture and you have this expectation that you're going to get all this. And then the reality is, the true reality is, they hopefully can continue to feed you the lies so you never see the reality, right? Never get it. And then you walk out of there, and they, they've never even opened their scripture. They've never read it. They put it up on the screen for you. They put 38 different versions up there. Maybe yours says this, and hopefully yours says that. What does yours say? Well, that's confusing. So, again, I digress, but this is how I feel a lot of times, too, is that the tabernacle, you know, the, the, the house of God is completely a wasteland. It's completely a wasteland. You know? It's not like there's a, a never-ending amount of churches. There's, there's a million of them out there. And... The, 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 if, if people would be honest, I think they would realize that they, they, don't really, they don't really know that much. And he says, and I will build again as it is in the days of old. So as in the days of old, it ran pretty well, especially under the rule of, of uh, David and the rule of Solomon. Of course, Solomon is like the highlight, right? It's the, it's the highlight reel. It's the, it's the golden years, right? Isn't they, don't they say that in football? Like whenever like the really good years, the golden years, or like the dream team for, for the Chicago Bulls back in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? So anyways, 
He says this, And that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. And so now this is what this is really the, the part that he's trying to prove. He says that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And so as we discussed a little bit, Edom is who? Edom is another name for Esau, right? And Jacob and Esau, remember Jacob is the name where Israel came from, where you have the 12 sons, and then Edom or Esau is, is the, you know, the hairy, hairy beast man, right? The wild, the wild man. And he is the one who is, you know, um, uh, we'll look at the book of Obadiah in just a second, but he's, he's, the out, he's the outlier. And then it says, and of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. So obviously James has a little bit of understanding about the book of Amos, right? He's, he's read this before and he's just making a click in his mind. He's like, well, think, think, oh, I see this thing about heathen and about there's going to be, there's going to be heathen who the name of God is called upon. So clearly, okay, you know, this shouldn't be an issue that Gentiles are being saved, right? You see how, see how his thought process is going? He's not trying to prove all of the book of Amos because surely he can't do that right now, right? And that's why I think he says, in verse number 13, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth the seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land. Look at that. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So that's the when. Well, that's the establishment of, that's really the establishment of, of the kingdom and then the new Jerusalem, right? You see how that kind of works. He says at the end, I'll plant them upon their land. He gives them that land. That's theirs. And I will, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them. Now, we looked a little bit over at, uh, look, look, look at the book of Obadiah just for a second, just briefly. And he says, um, Read what he says here in verse number one. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and our an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the, uh, the clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as an eagle, and though thy, thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Now, if you go down, uh, just, just for briefly a second, go down to verse number 10, and then we'll read verse 15, and I'm going to close with some of these things. Verse 10, he says, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob shall, co shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. And the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldest not look on the day of thy brother in that day, that he became a stranger, neither should, shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered in the gates of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those that, of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in, in, uh, in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. So what I want to say is go back to the book of Acts chapter 15 just for a second, and I'm going to, I'm going to close, close with these pieces of pieces and issues here. The reason why I read some of these verses in the book of Obadiah is it's showing you again, this is more issues in relation to, as you see, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. He's talking about how, 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 um, it, it, how, how you know a little bit about the story of Jacob and Esau, right? And, and what Jacob did and how he did not do what? What is the big issue that, that uh, Esau did not care about? Which is really what? The faith issue. Why is it the faith issue? Because it's the promise of God. Right. See how it works? See, he didn't, he didn't care about the promise of God. He said, the promise of God, fooey, I need some food in my belly. Right. I'm hungry. Promises of God, who cares? If he really understood what the promises of God were like Jacob did, he'd want those as much as he possibly could, right? So when you see what Jacob does, he, he does it because he does what? He really, truly believes the promises of God in relation to the birthright, and he wants that. He wants it badly. 
And there's a whole big issue that we could discuss. You know, people always say, Jacob, I have a love and Esau, I hate it. And then all of a sudden you go, yeah, but Jacob's kind of a thief. <laughs> and he's deceptive. We discussed this in our Romans 9 through 11 study because when everybody, anybody like that's a huge Calvinist brings up replacement theology, says things like, well, Jacob, have I loved and Esau, have I hated? And then I bring that up and I start saying, well, what do you mean, Jacob? Look at Jacob. Look what he did, like all these horrible things. And I was like, uh, uh. <laughs> and they get really confused. And like, well, what do I do with that? How do, how, do I, how do I reconcile those verses? Not to digress, I'm sorry. I, I, I just, I do that a lot. Acts chapter 15, closing with this, he as he says, after this, I'll return and build again the tabernacle of David. There's a reason why the tabernacle of David needs to be rebuilt. Why? Well, it's fallen down, right? And it's fallen down because they've done what? They've worshipped their God. And he says this, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. And he sets it up for the purpose of what? Isaiah chapter 2 says he sets that up for the purpose of what? That all the nations flow unto it, that the law comes out of it, and that he teaches them and he instructs them. It's kind of like going way back all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 4 when they talk about, you know, hey, look, Deuteronomy chapter 4, what does he say there? He says, look, who's going to say that they have a God closer to, to, to them than, than Israel has their God? Look what he does. Look how he instructs them. Look how he teaches them. He gives them everything they need to do. And you see here he says that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon, my, upon whom my name is called, say the Lord who doeth, all these things. That, that last part, who do with all these things, is important because he's, that's the main proof text. That's what he's trying to prove. Yes, he's trying to prove that the Gentiles are allowed to be evangelized or the Gentiles are being saved or whatever he wants to say, but at the end of the day, he's trying to prove that point right there. Who do with all these things? It's God that is doing this work. It's not us. I didn't make choice. God made choice, right? Simeon hath declared how that God at the first did visit the Gentiles. Notice that? How that God at the first to visit the Gentiles. God did it? Yeah, it wasn't Peter. Peter would have never visited the Gentiles had God not have come in and intervened. You follow me? He would have never done it. This is, Cornelius is a long time after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not like it's a year or two. It's a good distance away. And here's the funny thing. When would have Peter ever have gone and talked to the Jew Gentiles? And all the Jews that are with Cornelius, or all the Jews that are with Peter, when they go to see Cornelius, when Cornelius gets the Holy Spirit and everybody that's with him, and they start speaking in tongues like they did at Pentecost to prove to them what? Well, look, look what they got. They got the same stuff you got. Well, where's my difference? That's weird. And think about it. Think about it like this: every single guy that's there with Peter, not one of them goes, "Yeah, I've seen this before." I saw these Gentiles down over there in Antioch. They all got saved. No, they all sat there in amazement and was like. Huh? And that's why Peter goes, hey, can any man forbid him water? Uh, I don't know. What do we do with this situation? This is really strange. That's why the Holy Spirit keeps saying, stop being doubting, not believing. Stop being a doubter. Call Thomas a doubter. Man, call Peter a doubter. My goodness. He sits there and he tries to question his mind over and over and over again. I mean, you, when you have the angel of the Lord talking to you, don't you think you'd be like, all right, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> I just talked about this with somebody else the other day. I said, I said, you know, if you had, if you had, if you're, if you're Abram and you got God communing with you, right? You think you'd be like, people would say, well, God would just come down and talk to me. I would listen to what he had to say. Yeah, sure you would. But you know what you'd do? You'd mock him and you'd laugh at him, just like Abram did and so did Sarah, right? Right? Think about it. Sarah laughed. Abram laughed. Ha! We're going to have kids. That's funny, right? We look at it and go, who would dare laugh at God? You know? Why would you do that? unbelief not no faith in the promises don't take god's word seriously i take god's word pretty seriously it's pretty it's pretty serious but he says who do with all these things and here's the last part verse 18 is what he's trying to say he doesn't say james does not end it like this i know exactly what god is doing you guys are all foolish listen to me this is what god is doing no he says this he says known unto god are all his works from the beginning of the world he puts it back on God and says, look, God has a plan. God's doing something. Exactly what it is. I can give you a little bit about the Gentile ministry, but other than that, it's not really filling out as, as much as we would see. And, you know, as I've said repeatedly, I don't think a single apostle thought that, that not at least one of them would make it into the kingdom, right? Meaning that they would not see it, that they would not... They wouldn't 
die or be, be killed. And every single one faced that martyr's death without ever seeing the kingdom of God, right? Never saw it, never entered into it. And, and, and to me, without a knowledge of the mystery, you're pretty much going, well, that makes God a liar because if you're saying that, that if there is no mystery and that it's all the same stuff and now we're replacing Israel, well, it's too bad for those guys. You know, man, that's not fair. They all died and they had to face that and now, now what, right? I mean, it's funny because when, when Peter starts talking about not, not knowing that the long-suffering of the Lord, you know, he talks about, you know, uh, um, about the grace of God, right? Where is God? What, where is he? They'll still say. Remember, he talks about that. I can't think of the exact verse off the top of my head. And uh, he, he, it's, it's not willing that any should perish, right? But that all should come to repentance. He's like, this is the whole issue. It's like, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go longer. But he doesn't understand it. I really don't think he gets it. Even at the end of his life, he's still going like, how long is this going to go? If you would have came up to Peter and said, 2,000 years, he'd probably be like, what? 2,000 2, years? That's double the kingdom length. He'd be like, that's a long time. Well, I just listened to another guy the other day. One of these, it's actually a grace guy. I was going to talk to Russ about him. He's got some wackadoodle stuff. He's saying that all the, Jew, all, all the Jews are still in hell, all on the place of the dead, and they're all just hanging out there waiting to the kingdom. And I'm like, and this guy, we'll talk about that after. But anyways, uh, Next week we're going to pick back up, and we're going to—we'll probably be done with Amos for a little bit. We'll come back a little bit more, but we're going to talk about those four things he talks about. Right? He says, and here's the deal, Gentiles, we need you to do these four things. Fornication, you probably need to cut that out. Number two, things offered to idols, probably shouldn't be eating that stuff. Things strangled. And the blood thing, that's kind of freaking us out. Can you stop that? Right? So why doesn't he say of, 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 all, of, the, of all of the law of Moses, right? We're going to look at some of that stuff even predates the law of Moses. We're going to look at Genesis 9, 4 and talking about the blood issue. That's, that's way before even with Noah. But you'll see that in, 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 that, in that listing, why doesn't he say, um, how about no murder? And uh, you guys shouldn't do any stealing. No, um, what else is another really good one? No idolatry, right? Like, he doesn't use any of the big ones. He picks some random things. I think they're random. Picks fornication, kind of random. Out of all the, all the other sins that you could pick, he picks fornication. Things offered to idols, like, that's kind of weird. Okay, uh, things strangled, that's a weird one. And then, and then blood, that's strange, too. Does that mean that you can't have medium rare steaks? Is that what it means? Yeah? Does that, does that mean that you can't be a Jehovah's Witness? You, like Jehovah's Witnesses, you can't take blood transfusions? You've got to stay away from blood? Is that what it means? That's what they believe it means. They actually use that verse to prove that text. That's not what he's talking about at all. It's not even the, the, the remote context. Not, not even the, not in the, I can't even find a context that's even kind of like that. It's just a complete farce. So we'll pick that up next week. It's going to be really cool because I will show you that all of those have a specific purpose in there. And then Paul discusses each one of those. And what's really cool is that almost all of that actually stems back from Egypt. It's really cool. So anyways, we'll pick up there next week and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll close in prayer.